Good morning, Mountain Movers Church. <laughs> uh, Misty was just talking to me in the dark. She said, whatever you do, do not kick those balls into the crowd, as tempting as it may be. But I didn't promise her I tried her really anything. hard to get him to behave. I didn't say I would honor that, so it might happen. And I'll just tell you as a heads up, if you're not paying attention and I catch you, I'm going to kick this as hard as I can and try to beam you in the face. Like I did my brother Bill last week. And his wife got on to me. Miss Ann, if you don't know Miss Ann, you are underprivileged. Privileged. You need to meet her. She caught me in the foyer last service and she said, Pastor Brad, I need to have a word with you. You come here right now, mister. That's right, in her Boston accent. And she told me, I wasn't here last week and I heard you were picking on my husband. And I said, Yes, ma'am, I was. And it was worth every second. I said, but I tell you what, for being as slow as he is, he has quick reflexes because the ball almost hit him in the face. I almost did it. I, I, oh, almost did it again. <laughs> so I don't make any promises. I will also say, and I didn't run this by Misty for obvious reasons because <laughs> she would have told me not already. to say it. So, our, so uh, our, our kids' pastor, Willie, catches me in the hallway after oh. last service. I know. I know. And he said, hey, um, hey, Pastor, I just wanted to tell you, uh, uh, you, you preached the entire message with your fly down. I said, seriously? Really? I seriously did? He said, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was bad. I said, dude, you're fired. You, said, Why? you were sitting me. two feet from me the entire time. You didn't give me an X, Y, Z. You didn't give me one, the lawnmower. You didn't give me nothing. There's no loyalty whatsoever in that. So he's looking for a new job. You don't let your pastor preach the entire message with his fly down and not give some sort of international signal that your fly's down. Anyway, so if you guys know of any good churches that needs a less than average uh, kid's pastor... Willie's looking for a job. Okay. Um, so we're excited. Last couple days, some real progress has hit the campus. We are so excited. Uh, we have a new fence that is going in over here on the new 10 acres. And if awesome. it looks great. Looks so and, and, and for those of you that don't know the story, this is, this is a big, big God move. We had three and a half acres of land that we were on. We desperately needed more land. And the neighbors didn't have to show us any grace whatsoever. But by the mighty grace of God, they extended us the invitation to be able to buy that 10 acres. And so we are so, so grateful. We've had so many volunteers the last few days that have been working tirelessly to get the fence up. I think we've got a picture of one of our rock star volunteers, Chris Lyles, Dad. right here putting in the fence. And if you notice that, yeah, give him a hand. Yeah, woo! He was only one of many. One of say. many. There yeah. was many They volunteers. are very talented at building fence, but not photography. So we got one great pic, and it's of Chris. But there were lots of guys out You're there. You're mouthing his photography? That's <laughs> well, horrible. Well, it wasn't. Chris, I won't he say did who a good it was. Job. I know who it was. That's horrible. <laughs> but but you check out the little black the thing. black spot right behind. It's not a trash bag. That's actually his pet chihuahua, Fido. <laughs> and his name's not Fido. I just don't know what his name is. But that chihuahua goes everywhere, wherever Chris goes. And it's so funny. It's like his sidekick. He should have a badge number. Because when the, when, the, when the car door kicks open, the little chihuahua hops out and just follows Chris everywhere. He, everywhere. I've seen him at the gas station, and that chihuahua's trucking it across the park, and I'm like, that little thing's going to get squashed someday. I'm just saying, you got to watch it. But Chris trusts this dog with his life, and I don't know. He's going to get squashed. But, but, but he helped put the fence up, so go Fido. He's always with them. I just wanted to bring attention to that. The fence looks great. The bridge is going in. All this stuff is, is going to be in place. We're, we're believing by Freedom Fest, which is coming in just a couple weeks. Tell us about that's that. That's right. So we're like 10 days out from the biggest event we do all year long, and that's called Freedom Fest. And it's an opportunity for you to take those invites, invite people that you would think, you know what, I've been trying to get them to come to church, but they're kind of apprehensive on maybe coming in to a service on a Sunday. This is an event. There's It's n very non-threatening, all right? There's going to be food trucks. There's going to be free watermelon. There's going to be all kinds of music live all night, inflatables for kids, games for the teenagers like crazy stuff like they were going to do at Hype Night. And then at the end of the night, there's a huge fireworks display. And last year, Brad and I, we spoke a 10-minute message. You wouldn't believe I it. know you won't believe us, but we did. It was 10 minutes. It I'm, is possible. I'm sure it was timed, right? 10 minutes. 51 people gave their lives to Jesus yes. that night. They Isn't raised that awesome? their hands. 
blows me away that in a crowd of hundreds of people, right. 51 raised their hands out in the field to say, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. That's why we do that event. So take your cards. It's not just a big party. It's also an opportunity for your friends to come to know Jesus. It's a party with a purpose. That's right. I just thought of that. Oh, that was good. That you should good. write it down. I, no, I got it. It's right here. That's good. So uh, we, are, we are talking today in part three about destroying the silent killer inside each and every one of us. Inside us all, there is a silent killer. And it reminds me of a, a story, um, some friends of ours, a, a tragedy that happened a few years back. They, they received a phone call that none of us would ever want to get. Their parents had, uh, the husband's parents had been found, they f- were found dead in their home. And th- there was no signs of, of struggling. There was, there, it didn't seem to be homicide or anything like that, but they were just found dead mysteriously uh, in the home. And, and come to find out that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. And you guys have heard of this, and, and this is just a safety plug. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you have propane gas or I think natural gas as well, um, you need to get a detector in your home to let you know that those poisons are in the air because they're colorless, they're odorless. You can't tell that it's in the air a- a- until it's too late, and it just creeps up on you, makes you go out of your head, and then you just mysteriously pass away. Uh, and, and so it's a horrible tragedy that they experienced, but it, 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 it reminds me as we look at carbon monoxide poisoning, we call it the silent killer. And there's a silent killer that, that wreaks havoc in our hearts, in our own lives. It goes many times undetected. We can't even sense that it's here because I, I think we can't sense that it's there because we are so accustomed to living with it. And we don't realize that it's there. And it creeps up on you, and before you know it, it can wreak so much havoc in our lives until it erupts and causes this, pain, causes this painful explosion of consequences in your life and the lives of the ones that you love. And we're talking about the power of pride. It goes unnoticed, and we live with it, and it creeps up on us, and it absolutely destroys. So today, we're going to deal with pride. Pride is the driving force behind our desire to compare ourselves to other people or for us to get other people to compare themselves to us. See, in this series, we are reversing the curse of comparison because in summertime, everybody's out and about. You get to see everybody's lives exposed on social media everywhere you turn. We are seeing what other people are doing, where they're going, what they have. And it, there's such a tendency for us to compare ourselves and our lives to other people. So today, we deal with the root of the problem, pride. That's right. And if you're not taking notes today, I encourage you to because we are going to deal with a lot. And like Jake said, this is something that we all deal with, okay? So no one in the room is exempt. From the youngest to the oldest, all of humanity has dealt with this issue of pride. Believe it or not, it's the root of all sin. It was the cause for Lucifer to be cast out of heaven. Why? Because he wanted to ele- elevate himself to a position that God had never intended him to hold. He wanted to be the very, very best of the best. He wanted to be in the number one position where God was. And God said, okay, enough is enough. You've got to go. Pride is the reason that Adam and Eve had to be taken out of paradise, out of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, I mean, um, pride is the same reason that Brad said we compare ourselves to one another or we desire for someone to look at us and compare their life to ours. Pride is the very reason that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, that they despised him and actually crucified him. So this morning, we're going to start off as we go through this today in Luke chapter 18, and we're going to be talking about Jesus telling the story, this parable about pride to the Pharisees. Now, if you don't know what a parable is, it's just a story, okay? All throughout the New Testament, Jesus would tell these stories, and I love the way he does it because he, like, captivates you with a story. You love good storytellers. Brad is one, all right? I just have to brag on him. Like, when my kids were little, you, you never, and you never know, okay? you don't really know how much truth there is to some of his stories, okay? But he's a good storyteller, and he can, like, grab you and captivate you for a little bit. Wait a minute. Now, there is usually basis of truth, but it's exaggerated My my dad taught me how to tell stories, and he said, it's not lying if you don't remember all the details. And you fill in the holes? You just got to fill in the holes, and sometimes if if the story's not good enough, you you have to just stretch it just a little bit 
to make, make it, it better. better. So captivate you. So Jesus, Jesus would captivate people with these parables, with these stories, and then he would just undercut. He would just bring this point. It would just take you yeah. like a punch in the gut, all right? And that's what he does in Luke chapter 18. That's so right. we're going to go Wake there. up. Oh, my goodness. There you go. I told my daughter. It's getting quiet. And I know you don't want to hear us preaching on pride, but you better get with it. <laughs> it's about to hurt. I told my girls this message when is we hurt. stop talking. We're going to shut your mic off. I told the girls when we, <laughs> they will do it for me. I told the girls when we like bought the props for this, I was like, I don't know where we're going to put all these cool beach balls, but we need beach balls. And then they, they were like, mom, this is cool. And I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know how tempting that's going to be for your dad the entire time? He only made it stop here. Look. Okay. <laughs> oh. You totally dropped the ball. You're like a 10-year-old. Oh, my goodness. Dad joke. Okay. Wow. Bad dad joke. Happy all right. Father's Day to me. I'm glad he got it all out of his system. Oh, it's not out. Luke. <laughs> have you shared 18. Facebook Live yet? Oh, you should do if it. If you have not shared yet, please pull out your mobile device and share on. Yes, give me those. Thank you, what Lisa. Oh. Oh. You see, you see, fire. That's why. <laughs> but it was worth it, was it not? Let's just restrain. Her and Willie, maybe just they'll work restrain, at the same church. Restrain, not restrain. Oh. Refrain. All right, share on Facebook. Share on Facebook. Live. Thank you, Lisa. That was yes. Wonderful. We love yes. our Facebook Live family. We say hi to all of you. All right, Luke eighteen. If you are not blessed to live with someone with ADD, you can come to my house anytime you want. Okay, Luke eighteen. Verse 9, it says this. Then Jesus told this story or this parable to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Back up. Let's rewind it for a second. He told this to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness. What does that sound like? Confidence in my own righteousness or my own right positioning sounds a lot like pride to me. They scorned or they looked down on everyone else. He says this. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. What's a Pharisee? It's just a religious leader of the day, okay? So one is a Pharisee. The other is a despised tax collector. And in that day and time, tax collectors were known to be crooks. They ripped everybody off. They would charge you your tax plus a little and pocket it for themselves. So he says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. You see how he's kind of exaggerating this story. Like, who would do that? Nobody's going to stand in a church, right, in a temple, and say, Lord, thank you that I'm not like everybody else. See, They're Jesus not going to do that. He, Jesus exaggerates he the did. stories, too. He exaggerated okay. a little bit. A little bit. All right? He goes on. For I don't cheat, and I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like the tax collector, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Why? Because he didn't feel like he had any value. He didn't feel like he had any right to be there. All right? He was one that was not even going to look up to heaven when he prayed because he felt so ashamed of himself and his life. It says, instead, he beat his chest with sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. The word merciful, it literally means this. Mercy is when you get, when you don't get what you do deserve. He knew what he deserved. You see, he knew what he had done. He knew what his past looked like. And so did everybody else. Because anyone that saw a tax collector would automatically judge them based on their title and based on what all tax collectors were known for. He didn't have a chance in walking in and people accepting him. But listen to what this says. Verse 14, Jesus says, but I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. What does it mean to be justified? It means to be in right standing or in right positioning with God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, what's very interesting about this story and why Jesus shared this story is simply this. The Pharisees were very consumed with how they appeared to everyone else. They wanted to have it all together. They wanted you to look at them and think, wow, their life is so perfect. I mean, they do everything right. They fast twice a week. They give a tenth of everything they have. They serve constantly. They're so perfect. But what's interesting 
is Jesus doesn't look on the outside. He wasn't saying, hey, you get brownie points for all those things you do. No, he's saying, I look on the inside. And the fact of the matter is, the Pharisees never could see that they had a problem. Now, do not elbow your neighbor from here to the end when we say amen. Got it? This isn't for your spouse. This is just for you, and it's just for me, all right? My toes are going to get stomped on as well. God doesn't look at the outside. He's not concerned with what you think about me, okay? I want to be all put together. Brandy said it in her offering spill last time. She wants to be put all together. We don't want to show up looking like a hot mess and everybody knowing we're a wreck, right? That's what these Pharisees were doing. They were like, we want to have it all together. But the fact is, God looks on the heart, and he is more concerned with what's going on on the inside than how we have it together on the outside. You see, the Pharisees wanted to dot every I and cross every T, but they only did it because they cared what you thought about them. They weren't doing it because they wanted to honor God. They weren't doing it because they wanted to please God. It was about their motives. So Jesus said, look, that sinner who walked in feeling like he didn't deserve to even be in the house of God, that one that knows his life is such a wreck, he knows everything going on and he can't even hardly lift his eyes towards heaven to pray because he feels so bad about what he has done and who he is. God says, that's the one I'm pleased with because everybody else may look at you and think, you know what, you don't have it together. Your life is a wreck but I'm looking at your heart. And when you came in here today, you came in sincere before God knowing I'm in need of a savior. You see, pride at the very root of it says this. I got this all on my own. I don't have a problem. I don't need anybody's help. And that's why it's offensive to God because God wants his people to need him. God wants you and I to be dependent upon him, and that's the place that the tax collector was at. So this morning, we are going to deal with destroying this silent killer that has been bred into all of humanity. We're going to teach you how right now. As we deal with pride in our lives, in order to destroy it, to kill it, we have to admit that It's there. And the way to admit that it's there, the way to recognize or realize that it's there, is to open up ourselves before the Lord and ask God to search our hearts. That's why I love King David. King David, man, he was he was the dude. He was awesome. He made he made so many mistakes. He flubbed up so many times, but then you see him over and over and over coming before the Lord and crying out before God, pouring his heart out before God's throne and saying, Lord, I am a sinner. I have messed up, yet once again, I have completely blown it. Please, God, forgive me. And I open myself up before you, and I say, God, search my heart. Search everything that's in me, and if there's anything that is wicked, anything that needs to be dealt with, I pray, God, that you would deal with me now and show me what it is and let me deal with this so that I can become more like you. Thus, God gives King David the title, he is a man after my own heart. Yet you see him making all these mistakes. It's because he was so broken and so humble. God blessed David like no other king because he was continually broken before him. So we have to expose ourselves to the Lord and say, God, search me, know me, test my actions. Galatians 6 and 4 says, each one of us, we should test our own actions. And we, and yes, it's okay to have pride when we look at our own accomplishments within who God is and what he's done in our lives. Because of who we are in him, we can take pride in that without comparing ourselves to anyone else. We don't need to look at other people and, and what they have and what they've accomplished and, 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 take, and, 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 and compare ourselves and get caught up in that curse. Instead, we need to be more like David and say, God, show me what you've accomplished inside of me, that you might be lifted up and that I would be made low. So we're going to take a little self-test today. It's not going to be one of those fun pop quizzes. It's it's, it's, It's going to hurt a little bit because we're going to deal with it today in this room. We're going to deal with pride. Eight characteristics, traits of a prideful person. The first trait, all right, is the inability to admit you are wrong. And say those two words that none of us want to say. I'm sorry. Oh, man, it's tough. I remember when I was a little boy. I was, from the time I was just 
teeny tiny. I remember having these conversations with my dad, and we would go back and forth, and we would argue about the dumbest things. All the way up till I remember I was 15 years old, and I'm sitting here arguing with my brother because every 15-year-old knows everything. And I was arguing with him, and I just had to be right, and my brother said, Bradley, I wish I knew just half as much as you because then I would be Albert Einstein. I would be so brilliant because you just know everything. You know everything. You are God's gift to knowledge. Wow. Look at you. I mean, I was just a know-it-all. I had to be right. I remember one time I was riding with my dad in the car. Actually, it was a truck. It was a Ford truck. And we were driving. It was him driving. And, he's, and we're arguing back and forth. And he proved me wrong. And it hurt. And, and we're driving. He said, son? Yeah, dad. There's just three words I want to hear from you right now. What's that? Just repeat after me. Okay. I. I. Was. Was. Wrong. (laughs) Can't do it. I struggled. I remember that moment to this day. I could not say I was wrong. Something inside of me, it just doesn't feel natural. It doesn't, it doesn't make me feel happy. I don't like the feeling that I experience on the inside when I have to admit that I am wrong. Even to this day, I have a sign above my desk in my office, and it says, I could agree with you, but then we both would be wrong. <laughs> it's the real pain that I experience every day. It's for real, but it is a killer. And let me tell you, in our marriages, in your friendships, with your coworkers and your boss, with any human being you have any contact with, you've got to get to a place where you allow yourself to say, I was wrong, followed by, will you forgive me? Oh, (laughs) that hurt. It's a killer. I know. I know. I know it hurts. I know he can't. <gasps> Just kidding. Yeah. If I was going to do it. No. She picked him up. I'm not going to kick him. Leave him there. But it hurts. I don't want to say it. Pride. Don't let it in your relationships. It'll destroy. That's right. All right. So number two is this. Not submitting to authority. Now, when you hear the word submit, you're like, I do not like that word. Right? None of us want to submit because we want to be what? In control. We like our own thoughts. We like our own ways of doing things. But here's what's interesting about the word submit. It actually means to come under the mission of someone else. So when you are asked to submit, I want you to think about it like this. If you are working a job, whoever is over you and they are your boss, God expects you to honor them and the authority that he has given them, regardless of whether or not they're a believer, you are to honor them. The word of God says that we're to honor all people. One of the values of this church is that we are a family of unconditional love and honor. What does honor do? Honor elevates someone else. The only way I can elevate someone else is if I can get under and I can push up. See, the thing about it is for most of us, we think our ideas are the best ideas. We think we've got it all together. We want to be heard. But here's the thing. So often in our minds, we're thinking, you know, I, if I was in your place, If I was the boss, this is how I would do it. If I was mom, you know, if you've got kids, they'll tell you exactly how they think you ought to do everything if you have teenagers, all right? But the fact is, here's the thing. God's never going to elevate you to where you want to be. He's never going to give you the position to be over something until you can learn to get under whoever's authority he has placed over you right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? God wants to elevate you. He wants to promote you, but he's not going to do it until we learn how to honor. You may want a title. You may want a position, but it's not going to happen until you can learn to honor and elevate others around you. Number three. If you think you can continue to talk about your boss and their decisions, criticize their decisions and say, well, if I would, you know, you know the drill. If, if I was in charge, I would do this. I would, I would, I would do this. And you start bad mouthing your boss. You think God's going to promote you? You think God, because here's, here's the reality. When we do that, we elevate ourselves and God says, well, there's not enough room for you and I both to be elevated. You're going to have, one of us is going to have to lead here. So either you're going to make yourself low 
or you're going to lift yourself up and there's not room for both of us. So you're going to be on your own and then you're going to fall. So we have to honor whatever leadership God has put you under to submit to. You have to honor that leadership, whether you agree with them or not. It's just like a ball field. You're playing ball in a ball field, and it's, you're playing by their rules. It's their ball field. If you don't like the rules or you don't like their ball field, then maybe you need to work somewhere else, right? I know it's quiet in here, but I'm preaching the truth. Or maybe God has you there for a certain reason, and you're fighting against it when God's trying to teach you a lesson to submit to authority and to show honor for others. And he's, and he's having you cycle. He's not going to promote you. He's not going to elevate you. You say, well, I'm going to just go work over here. And he's like, all right, well, we're going to start all over until you learn the lesson and you get it right. Because I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to teach you to honor the authority that I've put under you. Or maybe I have you on assignment. Maybe you're supposed to win the coworker that's working in that cubicle next to you to Christ. But you can't even pay attention to that. You can't even see that because you're so consumed with how things are impacting number one. You're so consumed with you. When God says, this isn't about you. This is about me and what I want to do in you. So realize that I bought you with a price. You belong to me. You're the servant of the Most High God with a mission to do what I've called you to do. So bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. All right, honor, honor, honor. Okay, third thing. Mr. Know-it-all. You're the person that always has to have the answers. You always have to talk. You always have to say what you know. You are the answer person. If you were in medieval times, you would be Sir Talks a lot because you just talk, 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 talk. You just have to let people know what you know. You need to let them know what you know because you need to be elevated because you want to be seen. You want to say, look at me. Here I am, world. Look at me. Right? You want to be the center of attention. When you walk in a room, all the attention goes. You want all the attention. Stop. Stop trying to get all of the attention. Don't be the answer man. Sir talks a lot. You know what? Honestly, I think with almost all of these, although they're really, we're making it funny because we don't want to really beat everybody up because we all deal with it. But the fact is, It's not even, I think, that we walk into a room thinking, I want all the attention. But if we're not careful, that's how others perceive us. If when others are talking, we have to chime in and tell them what we know about that subject, whether they ask or not. We had a guy in college, I'll never forget. I honestly, like, he was always like that. And he was an older gentleman, and we honored him because that's what we should do. We should honor all people. But no matter what subject. I I could have been talking about sewing. I mean, I I could have been talking about cooking in the kitchen or baking a cake or or whatever. And he knew about everything. He's the expert. And I was like, he has got to be the smartest man on the face of the planet. You are amazing. You didn't want to have a conversation. All hail the power of your big name. I mean, let's worship you. Almighty, all-knowing. Goodness gracious. If (laughs) somebody (laughs) wants your opinion, I'm just telling you, they'll ask for it. But if they don't, don't give it. Shut up. All right. <laughs> number four. This is tough stuff, it's a man. Good message. My feet hurt. It's good. All right. Number four. Criticizing others or having a critical spirit. Sometimes it's not that we want to be number one or that we even want to be the boss, but we always want to run our mouth about everybody else around us. And honestly, if the shoes changed, you know, if what do, what do they say? Change the, feet. That's a new saying. If say? the shoes changed feet, well, I don't think I just you try that wearing up. them. If you Same. change positions, you would realize that you might not have all the answers, but we're very quick to criticize other people. Next week, come back. We gonna get we're going to deal with that one as we <laughs> bring all your wrap friends. It up You're all going to leave week. like this. <laughs> No, we're not. We're me all my, in this together. Me and my critical spirit just going <laughs> to go out to lunch because I just got beat up by Pastor Brad. All One right. One more Sunday. Number five. It's going to happen. Do you want to do it? It's yours, is but it you're, you Which are. Which one is it? Which one is it? Oh, thinking that you're better than others. Ow. That one hurt. <laughs> That's that. You're that one it. hurts. You know it. the difference between being cocky and confident? There's a difference. 
You, you can be confident in the gifts God's given you without, without letting everybody know that you're better than them. You ever meet that person right before the game, right before the match? They're running their mouth about how they're going to whip you. And then, and then they lose. That hurts their pride. I know. I know it hurts. It hurts. But here's why that happens. Proverbs 16 and 18 says, first pride, then the crash. And the bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Help me out. Timber! You like my sound effects? It, God will bring you down so fast. Stop thinking that you're something when you're nothing without Jesus. You are only who you are because of him. So stop directing attention towards you. Quit letting people know how good you are. And make yourself low so God will lift you up. All right, number six. We're winding it down, all right? Number six is this. This one's going to shock you. It's neglecting the Bible and our time in prayer. Now, you think to yourself, well, why would that be one of the characteristics of a person with pride? How'd well, that make it in there? Let, I know. How did That's, that get there? fit. Well, let me, let me tell you why. Because oftentimes, we even convince ourselves, okay, we love God, we go to church, we believe in God, all of those things, we've invited him into our heart, but we convince ourselves that I'm just too busy. I mean, I know, I know that this is good stuff. I know it is, and I can't always understand it, but it's good. Like, I get it. It's good stuff. I know that I should read it, like I should eat my vegetables, but you know what? I'm really just busy, and I, I know that I should pray, and I do pray. I do pray at times when I really need God or throughout my day, and all of that's good. But let me tell you why the root of this is pride. Because when you are doing that, what you're saying to God, okay? You're not saying it out loud. You would never say it out loud. What you're saying by doing that is, God, I've got this day all on my own. I don't need you to be a part of this. Because when you begin to realize in your life that, you know what? I don't know what this afternoon holds, See, I don't know what phone call I'm going to get. I don't know what, what's going to happen today, but God does. And God will prepare you ahead of time for what's going to happen today in your day, who you're going to come in contact with. Do you know that there's times in your life when God brings somebody in contact with you that he wants you to speak a word of encouragement into their life, but because you yourself didn't get into the word and get encouraged that morning, you have nothing to give because you are all down in the dumps yourself when God expected you to be full and overflowing and ready to push that out on somebody else. But the fact is, when we don't get into the word, what we're saying, to God is I 